Welcome back to the exciting book of Nehemiah. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride, but um, this will be the last trip. And the last go-round for Nehemiah here in uh, chapter 13. You know, but before Nehemiah, whose name means the appointed one of Yah, before he leaves, he leaves us with a challenge for the ecclesia now today. You know, we've been going through this book and we've been likening it unto our current time, you know, a time when the temple was torn down, was in need of rebuilding. And, you know, um, we can look and see that the temple made with our hands, the temple that was set up during the time of Messiah, you know, um, and with him and his apostles, that it's in shambles. It's in shambles. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, they they constructed it, you know, real well before before they took off and you know, everybody uh entered in the covenant as we seen with Nehemiah and promised to do everything that they were supposed to do, um that's entailed in the word of Elohim and entered in the covenant with him and all that great stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and then Nehemiah takes off even as Yahshua took off, you know. But Nehemiah returns, even as Yahushua will return. Amen? Amen. But he doesn't quite find it the way he left it. So, let's see um, just how he finds it. Okay. Nehemiah 1. It says, On that day they read in the book of Moshe in the audience of the people. On what day? This is um, still picking up from chapter 12 when during the day of dedication when they dedicated the walls and everything. It says, On that day they read in the book of Moshe in the audience of the people and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabites should not come into the congregation of Elohim forever. Wow, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. The word Ammonite, or the name Ammonite, I should say, um, speaks to those who are inbred. You know, I don't know if um, you guys remember Ammon, but Ammon was the son of one of the two daughters of Lot that, you know, uh, committed the ancestral relationship or ancestral act with their dad because they thought the world was coming to an end and had offspring. And... Uh, Lot has had two daughters that, that done likewise, and one had Ammon and the other one had Moab. You know, so these these two these two speaks to you know that sin. It speaks to the offspring of sin, the children of sin, if you would. Okay, so spiritually speaking, you know what the script uh, scriptures are, is is the the picture that is painting is that. You know, the Ammonite and the Moabite, that is, the children of sin, should not come into the congregation of Elohim forever. And that makes more sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, um, verse 2, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our Elohim turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the Torah that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. You know, and this is exactly what we have to get to in, in our rebuilding of the temple as well. You know, we have to dedicate ourselves to the Most High El, and we have to separate ourselves from the children of sin. Amen? Amen. You know, Apostle Paul put it, put it quite well in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. My first reader, please. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Messiah with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of Elohim with idols? 
for ye are the temple of the living Elohim. As Elohim hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Adonai, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Hallelujah. So here it is. Apostle Paul is teaching that we are the temple of Elohim. Amen. Amen. We're that temple of Elohim just as that temple of Elohim was existing in the time of Nehemiah. Amen. Amen. You know, stuff for one was made with hands and one was made without hands. Amen. You know, one was the construction of, of uh, men and the other was the construction of Elohim. You know, now here it is. It says, you know, of course, not to, to be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. We shouldn't be unequally yoked with the children of sin. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? You know, I always like to give the analogy of the righteous being being those in, in those those three piece white suits and those those uh hundred percent pure white dresses. You know, and, and in order to keep those those uh white garments white, you know, they should only walk around those with other the, uh others with white garments. If they start walking around the folks of the world who are covered with filth thinking that their cleanliness is going to rub off on that filth, they're going to be in for a big mistake. Mm -hmm. They're only going to find that their, their cleanliness is getting dirty. But the dirty, the dirty uh, uh, garments are not getting any cleaner. See, it doesn't work that way. You know, when light mixed with darkness, you know, it makes the light darker. When righteousness mixed with, with unrighteousness, it makes the righteousness you know, um, the righteousness tend to become more unrighteous. So, Apostle Paul says, Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Righteousness have no business with unrighteousness. And, and what communion has light with darkness? And what concord have Messiah with Belial? Or what part have he that believeth with an infidel? Just makes sense, doesn't it? You know? We're, we're supposed, supposed to be the temple of Elohim. We don't have no, no business messing around with idols. We don't need no idols in our temple. Right, man? Amen? You know, so, you know, this is what's being said here in Nehemiah 13, 1. You know, this is what had come about, if you would, as, as we're going to see. And verse 4 says, and before this, El Yashib, the priest, the who? The priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our Elohim, was allied unto Tobiah. Mm -hmm. Anybody remember uh, who, who Tobiah or Tobiah uh, um, was? Yeah. You know, we've been hearing about him all throughout the book of Nehemiah. He was the arch enemy. Mm -hmm. He was the enemy from the very beginning. Yeah. You know, now here it is. We see the priest, and actually this was the high priest, El, El Yashid, and ended up being the high priest. And he had oversight over the chamber of the house of Elohim. He was allied unto Tobiah, or Tobiah, if you would. Now, El Yashi, his name means El will restore. Now, that's what he should have been doing, restoring the things of Elohim, you know, uh, seeing that they were trying to put this thing back together. They, he should have been allowing Elohim to utilize him to restore the um, way things should be, even as we should be trying to restore the ancient past you know, of Elohim that, that speaks to uh, what we should be doing as well. But instead of doing this, you know, he found himself allied to Tobiah, or Tobiah if you, if you prefer. And Tobiah means the goodness of Yah. And he even went so far, it says in verse 5, and he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priests. Now the picture scripture is painting here is that the priesthood was unequally yoked to an imposter. That is someone who appeared as the goodness of Yah, but in reality was Israel's enemy. Now this union would eventually cause those joined to Yah, i.e. the Levites, the singers, the porters, the offerings um, of the priests, to flee. And we're going to see that that actually came about later. And, you know, why would they flee? Because there's no provisions for them. There's no, there's no rations for them. There's, they have no way to, to live. Mm -hmm. You know, so 
naturally they'll flee and, and they, he took even took the room in which uh, he was supposed to be taking the goods to take care of the Levites, the porters, and um, the priests, and gave it to the enemy. Mm. How about that? Mm. You know, so what we have here is a picture of the priesthood being yoked with the enemy and the enemy posing as the goodness of Yah. Mm. But in reality, is causing those who are truly joined to Yah to flee from the house of Yah. Mm -hmm. Now, for those with eyes to see, the same can be said today in those who proclaim to be the priest of Yah, which are yoked with man. And if we look out today, we, you know, we hear a real popular message, you know, called prosperity um, um, gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, even though I don't read about the prosperity gospel in the Word, you know, this is a very popular gospel. Now, uh, it differs from the gospel of Yahushua. The gospel that Yahushua um, spoke when he was walking and talking upon the earth, as well as uh, his disciples and, and apostles. It differs. Yes, it does. You know, but it's very prevalent today, all the same. And what I'm posing here is that this picture that was that, that scripture is painting then is still prevalent even now today. That in a manner of speaking, if we have spiritual eyes to see, we can see that the priests, i.e. the leaders of Yah's uh, assemblies, many of them are yoked with mammon. They are yoked with mammon, which also appear to many, that's the onlookers, as the goodness of Yah. And that's the way it's, the way it's purported and propagated to the people, is that this is the goodness of Yah. And if you want this goodness of Yah, then you need to come on and join with us. You know, now this goodness, this so-called goodness of Yah, you know, has been put in the place of those who have truly joined themselves to Yah. You know, and, you know, just as we see here with El Yashi, we look and we see that there was, you know, he gave away the storerooms, you know, for all the offerings for the, for the Levites that were supposed to take care of them, and he gave them to his buddy. So, you know, seeing that there was no room to even put that stuff, you can imagine, you know, uh, you know what they did with it. They used it for themselves. You know, and, and hence, you know, you see the same thing now today. You see the leaders of Yah's assemblies yoked with something that looks or appears to many as the goodness of Yah. You know, this has to be of Yah. Look how rich they are. Look at, look at how prosperous they are. Look at all the, this, that, and the other that they have. You know, surely this is the goodness of Yah. You know, this is Tob Yah. This is an imposter. This is an imposter. This is some, something that's posing as the goodness of Yah. Now, not to say that Yah doesn't want you to have nice things. He does. You know, but that's not the end all be all. You know, that's not the objective here. You know, Yah's prosperity for us is a byproduct. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the objective, it's the byproduct of the objective. The objective is to be pleasing to our L. And the byproduct of being pleasing to our L is these so called blessings. The things that, you know, that, that causes us to be comfortable. I.e., you know, the, uh, the things, you know, the houses, the cars, and, and the excess uh, uh, money, and, and, and so on and so forth. These things are a byproduct of the objective, which, is, should, which should be to be pleasing in God, which should be righteousness. You know, yes, the righteousness, the righteous shall be blessed. They shall receive the goodness of God. You know, but... That's the evil with this, with this message that's being purported now today. It's like, come on, you can be prosperous, but, you know, you don't have to be righteous. You know, all you have to do is sow a seed. You know, that is not scriptural. But, you know, just as we see what was going on here in the time of Nehemiah, we see the same thing going on now today. You know, Tob Yah or Tobiah is in the courts of Elohim. Make no mistake about it. You know, he's in there now today, and he is yoked with the priest. Mm -hmm. Let me have my next reader read verses 6 
through 11 of Nehemiah 13. But in all this time I was not at Jerusalem, for in the 2 and 13th year of Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon, I came unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem, and understood the evil that of Elshiv did for Tobiah, in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of Elohim. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all of the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of Elohim, with the meat offering and the frankincense. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one of them, every one to his field. Then I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of Elohim forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Okay, there's coming a time, and there's coming a time soon when our king, King Yahushua, is going to send a Nehemiah you know, back to the temple. <laughs> he's going to send an appointed one back to the temple. And then when he comes back, he's going to see it as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to see, you know, Tobiah or Tobiah, you know, yoked up with the leaders. And he's not going to be pleased either. You know, even as we see it says, for in the 2 and 30th year, of uh, Ataxerus, king of Babylon, came I unto the king. And it's interesting, number 32 speaks to covenant. You know, so, you know, it speaks of a time of covenant. That he came back, you know, and he began to, uh, you know, see what's, what had become of the place. And he says he came to Jerusalem and understood the evil that, that El Yashid did for, for Tobiah. In preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house. And it grieved him sore. You know. And he said. You know, but he just didn't leave it at, at, uh, at that. You know. He done something about it. Because he was the one appointed. You know. He was appointed to Yah. So he said. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. He gave him the big shoe. He evicted him. He got him up out of there. And then he commanded. And they cleansed the chambers. They cleaned the place up. You know, we have to come to the point to where we get sick of this stuff and, and throw that, throw, throw Tobi out, up out of our lives, throw this fake, this fake uh, wannabe goodness of Yah out and get the real goodness of Yah. Amen? Amen. You know, it says, uh, he brought again the vessels of the house of Elohim with the meat offering and frankincense, and he perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. Why is that? It says, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. Now we know in scripture the field represents what? The world. The world. Yahshua taught us that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so here it is. We see that the Levites and the singers, they, they fled from the house of Elohim. They fled from the temple and everyone went back into the world. You know, that's, that's you know, very similar to what's going on now. You know, so this one that was a point, that's a point, began to contend with the rulers and said, why is the house of Elohim forsaken? And he gathered them together and set everybody in their place. Now once the course of Elohim has been cleansed and the things are put back in their proper places and the storehouses are uh, restored, there won't be any trouble getting those who are truly joined to Yah to return. Because they want to serve Yah anyway. Amen. You know, the only reason that they left is because, you know, they can't live and serve Yah because, you know, they're not giving them their rations. They're not giving them what's, what's needed to survive. You know, you have to remember, you know, hey, you know, the Levites, their inheritance was Yah. You know, so if you don't give them what Yah has ordained for them, then they can't make it. And that's why Yah always tell you, don't forget about the, the, um, the widow, the orphan, and the Levite. You know, because, you know, they have no one. All they have is Yah. And in case you was uh, work, um, wondering, uh, Taxerus, uh name means the great warrior. You know, so here it is. We see this situation even prevalent now today. Verses 12 and 13 says, Then brought all 
Yahoo to the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil into the treasuries. Okay, now we got the stuff flowing back again. You know, we're bringing it back in. But this time, we're using these things for what they were purposed for. They wasn't purposed just so Tobiah and El Yashid, the priest and, and the, uh, the imposter, you know, um, that, that looks like the goodness of Yah. It wasn't, it wasn't intended so that they can just, you know, live off of the fat of the people. It was intended so that those who are joined to Yah, you know, could do their jobs. That's what it was intended for. So now that they done cleaned it out, they done uh, cleaned the place up, they bring it, they're bringing it back, you know. They brought all, the, all of um, Yahuda, and Yahuda represents who spiritually? The praisers of Yah, absolutely. The praisers of Yah, the worshippers of Yah. You know, and this is what you have to keep in mind. You know, when you see Yahuda, think praiser of Yah, think worshipper of Yah. You know, this is this is speaking to us. You know, then brought all of the praises of Yah, the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil into the treasuries, and I made the treasurers over the treasuries, Shalem Yah, the priest, and Zadok the scribe and the Levites and Padayah, and next to him was Canaan, the son of Zakur, the son of Matanyah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. You know, Shalem Yah means thanks the offering. You know, thanks offering of Yah. You know, so here it is, the treasurers, you know, uh, the priests, you know, they begin to offer the thanks offerings of Yah as they should. You know, they, they begin to, you know, gather the righteous and those who are redeemed of Yah and the merciful and those who are mindful of the things of Yah and those who have the gifts of Yah. You know, this is the ones that we need to bring back into the ecclesia. This is, these are the ones that we need to bring back into this temple made with our hands so that they can do their job, so they can watch over things, you know, and get things back in order. Amen? Amen. You know, uh, Nehemiah says, remember me, O my Elohim, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my Elohim and for the offices thereof. See, we get these things back in place, you know, then things will run smoother. Mm -hmm. Things will go back to the way they used to be. You know, we will restore the ancient, ancient paths, restore the ancient ways, because those are the ways that worked. And we see when we stray from that way, we see it all fell apart. This is what Nehemiah and, and the folks during his time, this is what they noticed, and this is what we can reflect on, upon and look back in retrospect and see as well. Let me have my next reader read verses 15 through 17 of Nehemiah 13. In those days saw I in Judah some trending wine presses on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, and also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold um, vic victuals. <coughs> there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath un unto the children of Yehuda and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Yehuda and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our Elohim bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet, you, yet ye bring more wrath upon uh, Israel by profaning the Sabbath. All right. You know, pretty dire circumstances here. You know, but, you know, we can't, can't look at it and say, well, if we were, you know, back then, we wouldn't, uh, and we, we couldn't, uh, and no way they ought to, you know, because the same thing is happening now today. Again, it can be said in today's time, for I see many treading the wine presses on, on the Sabbath. You know, and, you know, there's no coincidence that the wording here, that the wording that's utilized here is here, you know. It's here for a reason. You know, in those days I saw Yahuda. In those days I saw the worshipers of Yah. I saw those that praise Yah, treading the wine presses. You know, uh, treading the wine presses. Who is the vine? 
Yahshua. And he said, who are the branches? And we're to bear much what? Okay, now how do you make wine? You press the grapes. You know, so that's our fruit getting pressed. Amen? You know, that's us getting, getting cut and pressed in those wine presses. You know, and so I see now today with the priest that's yoked up with this imposter that they call the goodness of Yah, which is really nothing but man. You know, I see them squeezing the fruit. I see them squeezing the grapes out of every dime. I mean, out of every um, ounce of juice. Every nickel, I mean juice. Um, <laughs> every penny, I mean juice. Okay, yeah. They're squeezing the grapes. They're squeezing the people of Elohim. You know, and it goes on to say uh, the wine, the grapes, the figs, you know, the figs speaks to, even speaks to the, to the Levites and the priests and all manner of burdens, you know, they're lading the behinds, you know, that they're, they're putting such a load on the ecclesia, the, the behind speaks to the ecclesia or the church, you know, and they, they're putting such a load on them, you know, that it's hard for them to bear, you know, and they're doing all these burdens even, they're doing it even on the Sabbath, even on Yah Shabbat. And so here it is, the one that was appointed of Yah, Nehemiah, he says, I testified against them in the day wherein they were sold. And it says, you know, there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish. Now, why do you think this is here? Now, you can be pretty certain that just not only the men of Tyre were there, but many others were there as well. You know, because the merchants are always going to go where people are because are, they want to sell stuff, right? You know, but it mentions Tyre specifically, and, and, and it's because of what the name Tyre means. Tyre means a rock. You know, and for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, the men of Tyre speak to the Christians. You know, the Christians are the men of the, of the rock, you know, which brought fish. You know, didn't the ecclesia, you know, um, didn't Yahshua tell his disciples uh, before he made them his ecclesia, he said, you know, uh, they were, you know, the ones that were fishermen, which were many. He told them to come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of what? Yeah. Fishers of men. You know, and here it is, we see there dwelling the men of Tyre also, which brought fish and all manner of wear and sold on the Sabbath day unto the children of Yahuda, unto the praisers of Yah. You know, and he contended with the nobles of Yahuda. He contended with the leaders of the praisers of Yah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? So let us also take note that it is an evil thing to profane the Sabbath day, which brings about Yah's wrath. Yet it has ceased to be sacred for most believers during the time of Nehemiah, as well as those of us today. You know, the Sabbath is not respected on the most part. It is very much neglected by Yahuda, by the praisers of Yah. You know, and... Think not for a second that it's not going to bring about the wrath of Elohim, because it will. Even as it has before, it will again. You know, so this is something to, to, um, to really take to heart. My next reader, verses 19 through 22. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set eye at the gates, that there, sh should be, that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. <coughs> then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should, should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O Elohim, concerning this also, 
and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Hallelujah. You know, it's clear to see that Nehemiah puts great emphasis on the Sabbath. You know, here it is, you know, he, he figures out a way to stop, stop this going on. He closes the gates, and then they begin to lodge outside the gates, you know, until, well, we're going to just sit here and wait till you open it. And anybody come up, we're going to sell to them. Or anybody come out, we're going to sell to them. You know, so this happened once or twice, it says. You know, they lodged out outside of uh, Jerusalem once or twice because when it began, when sun began to set and, and Shabbat was coming along, he locked the gates. So when he seen them lodging outside, he said, you know, why lodge ye about the wall? Do it again. See what happened to you. <laughs> I paraphrase, right? You know, <laughs> he said, if you do so again, I will lay hands on you. You know, don't hurt nobody near mine. You know, uh, and from that time forth, <laughs> came they no more on the Sabbath. He got his point across, did he not? Yeah. You know, then he told um, Levites, look, you got to clean up your act. You know, get clean, get clean once again, you know, and come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day so that we won't bring the wrath of Elohim upon us once again. You know, so it's clear to see that Nehemiah puts great emphasis on on the Sabbath, knowing its importance, and that profaning it brings about Yah's wrath. Right. Now, could it be that because of many other leaders of the faith today has forgotten this crucial concept, or maybe it's just because they're just simply who they are and not Nehemiah? Maybe they're just not appointed of Yah, hmm. even as Nehemiah's name means. You know, they're, they're who they are, and Nehemiah, he was appointed of Yah. You know, because I believe those who are appointed of Yah, they're going to do the things that are pleasing to Yah. Amen? Amen. They're not going to be yoked with the enemy. Amen. See, and this is the very thing that, that we see that was going on, you know, in Nehemiah's time. And this is, in our actuality, the very thing that we see going on now today. Mm -hmm. We see the leaders, we see the leaders of, uh, quote-unquote, Christianity yoked with an imposter, you know, that, that appears to be the goodness of Yah. You know, uh, you know, we see, you know, Christianity's, uh, I don't know what to call them, um, I don't, uh, supposed head, i.e. the Pope, you know, um, walking around when the hat of Dagon, the very hat that the high priest of Dagon would wear. You know, the fish hat. I mean, why, did, why is that? Yeah. You know, so when you look at these things, you can, it's not hard to see that they're yoked up with some stuff that they shouldn't be yoked up with. You know, it's, it's, it's very apparent. You know, and, and not, you know, not just picking on, on the Pope, you know, but there's many, many other leaders. You know, many other leaders uh, uh, in the Protestant churches that are yoked up with things that are not of Yah as well. You know, all the way across, you know, um, even in the quote-unquote messianic circles, you know, there are some of the leaders that's yoked up with some things that are not of Elohim um, there as well. You know, so this thing, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all throughout the faith. You know, but the point is we need to identify it and do away with it. We need to clean it up. Those who are joined to Yah need to uh, come back and take their rightful places. We need to clean out those storehouses, kick the the um, imposters out and rearrange things the way that they're supposed to be, the way the word says that they should be, and begin to operate in the manner that the word dictates. You know, I'm convinced that all those who are appointed of Yah will come to the same or similar conclusions concerning the things of Yah if they operate in truth and sincerity. You know, because if they're truly appointed of Yah, then Yah is going to reveal his truth to them. And if they're sincere, then they're going to walk in that truth. You know, Yah says in Hosea 4, 6, My children perish for lack of knowledge. Because they reject knowledge, I will reject them from being my minister. You know, it's not that, you know, knowledge don't come to them, that Yah doesn't send it. You know, many of them just choose to reject it because it doesn't look as appetizing as being yoked up. Well, told Yah. 
Selah. Mm -hmm. You know, we see Nehemiah putting a whole lot of emphasis on the Shabbat, you know, and, and because he understood some things that a lot of believers don't understand now today. You know, we're going to take a look at as, um, some of the things that he would have been familiar with that maybe some of uh, us or some of the, the um, believers now today aren't. In Exodus 31, verses 13 through 17, we read, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know, that ye may know, that ye may know I am Yahuwah that do sanctify you. How else will you know that Yahuwah is sanctifying you? He's telling us how we can know right here. Yeah. You know, Yahshua would pray in, in Yochanan 17, you know, that's, that's Yahushua's prayer to his father, you know, concerning our well-being. And he, he would say, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. You know, and here it is, we know keeping the Shabbat is a part of his word. Amen? Amen. He says here, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. This word sign, I'm sorry, I should have um, put it up there, but it's oat in the Hebrew. You know, and it means a sign, a mark, a distinguishing mark, a signal. You know, so we have a signal. We have a distinguishing mark. We have a sign. We have something to... to uh, Alert us that Yah is with us and that he's sanctifying us. And it is his Shabbat. Verse 14, ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is kadosh unto you. It is holy unto you. It is set apart unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now, do you think that Yah just forgot about that? That that's not in effect anymore today? No, he did not just forget about that. You know, you may not be put to death right now because you choose not to keep it. But that don't mean you won't be put to death. You know, there's a natural death and there's a spiritual death. I mean, you know, could it be that that soul shall be cut off from among his people spiritually? You know, actually, I'd rather be cut off physically than spiritually. I mean, verse 15 says, six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Kadosh, holy to Yahuwah, whosoever do of any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. What does perpetual mean? Forever. All right, forever and ever. Verse 17, it is a sign, an oath, a signal, a distinguishing mark between me and the children of Israel forever. Last time I checked, that word forever meant forever <laughs> and for in six days Yahuwah made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed also we read in Ezekiel 20 verses 12 and 13 it says moreover I gave them my Sabbaths this is Yah speaking he says I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them why why father why that they might know that I am Yahuwah that sanctified them okay you know, for those who are hard-headed here, you have a second witness. <laughs> you have a second witness. Let every matter be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen? Amen? Okay, so here it is. Here's a second witness that if you want to know that Yahuwah is sanctifying you, then you have a sign, you have a signal, you have a distinguishing mark in which you can know. And that mark is the Sabbath says, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walk not in my statutes. They despise my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths, they greatly polluted. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Don't you know when you go against Yah's Sabbath, when you begin to profane it, that he will pour out his wrath upon you? And that doesn't mean that he's going to pour it out 
you know, right to second all the time, you know, but it doesn't mean that he won't either. Sometimes it comes fast, sometimes it comes slow. But it, yeah, you can rest assured, it's coming. Verses 19 and 20 of Ezekiel 20 says, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. That is not a request, by the way. That is an order. And hollow my saddles, and they shall be a sign between me and you. But well, why, Father? That ye may know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. So how do you know, we all know and, and trust and believe that Yahuwah is Elohim, but how does he, do you know if he's your Elohim? Amen? Amen? You know, the peoples of the world, during the time of Moshe in Israel, when he brought Israel out of Mizraim, they, they, they heard about Yahuwah real quick. The, the word traveled fast all over the known world, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and they knew about Yahuwah, and they knew that he was Elohim, but they referred to him as Yahuwah, their Elohim. Who's Elohim? Israel's Elohim. You know, so, you know, we know that he exists and we know that he's Elohim, but how can we know that he's our Elohim? <laughs> By hallowing his Sabbaths. And they shall be a sign, they shall be a signal, they shall be an oath, a distinguishing mark betwixt us and Yah. And that's how we can know that Yah is our Elohim. Also consider Revelation 12, verses 14 through 17. It says, and this is just as a backdrop, this is um, uh, speaking of um, the woman that gave birth to uh, to the son, in the, that gives birth to the son in the last days, in our actuality. You know, and then she goes into the wilderness. And it says in verse 14, it says, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. Now this is, she flies into the wilderness after the, um, the devil is cast out. It says that the devil was cast out in like verse 13, and then verse 15, it says, And the dragon, you know, um, began to, to um, persecute the woman that gave the remnant, of the, the woman in the remnant that gave um, birth to the man-child, okay? And so then, that's just a little backdrop, and then verse 14, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by, of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now this is why we came here. Verse 17 it says, and the dragon, who's the dragon? Satan. Satan, the devil, right? Yeah. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Elohim, and have the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. Now, I want you to ask yourselves, I want you to ask yourselves this very crucial question. Why doesn't the devil go after all Torah keepers? Why doesn't the devil go after all Christians? Do you notice that? You notice that he goes after them which keep the commandments of Elohim. Now, you have the Torah keepers, i.e. the Yahudim, who keep the commandments of Elohim, amen? But they do not have the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. Then you have those who have the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach, i.e. the Christians, who don't keep Torah. They don't keep the commandments of Elohim. See, can you see how unique of people we are? Can you see how we actually fit the mold of the true ecclesia, we fit the mold of the true believers of Elohim. See, the devil is not concerned with the other ones because he's already had them. He has them already. There's no need to be concerned with them because they are not a threat. He's concerned with those who are a threat to him. So that's why he come, He goes to seek to do away with them. And those that he seeks to do away, those, the woman, i.e. the bride of Messiah, you know, that gives birth to the sons of Elohim, are those which keep the commandments of Elohim and have. That word, those words and have actually in the Greek means that are holding 
they keep the commandments of Elohim and are holding the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. They don't drop it. They're holding the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. They don't let it go. You know, just like those, those uh, people who were murdered because they said that they were Christian. You know, if you got, and we all got to go. But if you got to go, that's the way to go. Go for the, go for the, for the will and way and purposes of Elohim. Go because you believe in the one true El. If you're going to kill me, kill me for that reason. But there's a whole lot of worse reasons to die. Amen? You know, see, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Elohim and are holding the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. You have to get this into your spirit, see, because there's not too many of people on this planet that are doing these two things. It's only a very small remnant that are doing both Torah and have a testimony of Yahushua. The mass majority, they're either just Torah keepers or they're just carrying the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. They're not doing both. It's important that we do both. It's important that, you know, the Messiah, he taught, he, in, in Matthew Yahoo 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. He says, those who, who seek, those who don't do the least of these commandments, speaking of Torah, and teach others not to do them as well, they will be called least in the kingdom. But those who do them and teach others to do them also will be called great in the kingdom. You want to be the least or you want to be great? You know, we're seeking to be great. You know, and if we're going to be great, then we're going to have to keep the commandments of Elohim and hold on to the testimonies of Yahushua Mashiach. You know, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Elohim. Amen? Amen. You know, and, and see, you know, this is a real crucial question. You know, that many people don't ask themselves, why isn't he going after the Torah keepers? Why isn't he going after the Christians? Why is, the, is, he, is he going after the ones who are doing both? And just look at the world today and see. You know, it's not hard to visualize how many are doing both. It's not hard at all. There's very, very few. There's very, very few. You know, but... Just the mere fact that we exist speaks to the validity of this statement. Because, you know, short time ago, there were no people that were doing both. You know, not, not as groups. Maybe there was one or two, you know, I don't want to have the... Uh, the Elijah complex, you know, thinking that, you know, hey, it's just one, you know, and God, you know, and, you know I have 7,000, you know. But, you know, we know it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, thrones of them. We know it's not thrones now. You know, so this is, this is real. This is real big. You know, this is real big to get into your spirits. It's real big to, to get into your heart and to understand, you know, hey, why is the devil only going after them that's keeping his commandments and holding on to the testimony of Yahushua. You know, how come he's not going after one or the other or, you know, it, how come it, it's, that criteria is there? You know, that's, that's one to think about. Say a lot. <clears throat> Let me have my next reader read Nehemiah 13, 23 through 26. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by Elohim, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, 
nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his Elohim, and Elohim made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Hallelujah. Okay, so here it is again. We see in those days also, I saw the Yahudim. I saw the praises of Yah. Had Mary wise of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab. You know, in other words, I've seen the praises of Yah. They married the children of sin. You know, and we see that a lot now today, I mean. Yes. We see the believers married to children of sin. You know, come on. We have to, we have to start waking up. We have to start, you know, opening our mouths and preventing these things from happening. What's done is done, but what's about to be done can, can be haunted. You know, we can keep some of this stuff from happening. We may not be able to change the past, but we can definitely do something about the future. Amen? You know, he said, I contended with them and cursed them and smoked certain of them. He even pulled their hair off. I wouldn't suggest that you go that far. <laughs> you know, y'all said be wise as a serpent, yet gentle as the dove. So, you know, I wouldn't, you know, suggest that you go pulling folks' hair out. You know, um, it says, ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons or for yourselves. And he, he gives King Solomon as an example. You know, he's taking this from... Um, 1 Kings 11, 4 says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other Elohim, after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with Yahuwah, his Elohim, as was the heart of David, his father. You know, see, and this is what these, these children of sin will do for our children, for the children of righteousness. It will cause them to turn their heart after other gods. You know, and this is how we got in this mess in the first place. So we need to restore the ancient past, stop doing the things that got us in this situation, and start doing the things that are pleasing to the Most High. Amen? Amen. You know, so uh, also we see that the children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Yah Yahudim's language, but according to the language of each people. So, you know, now... There's a lot of folks who take this opportunity to say, well, see, hey, you know, uh, you should learn Hebrew. You know, but I see a spiritual picture that's being painted here. You know, when I read this, I see that the children spake half in the speech of the, of the ravagers, you know, the children of sin. You know, for when I look around and I see, you know, Yah's, Yah's um, the children of Yah's people, I see them speaking as ravagers, you know, hey, you know, you better give me this, I, you better do that, you better do so on and so forth, and, you know, boo, 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 you know, that's, I had to censor that, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that type of language, you know, rather than speaking the Yahudim's language, the language of a worshiper, the language of a praiser of Yah, you know, how do a praiser of Yah, how do a worshiper of Yah sound? You know, when they begin to speak, you know, how do they sound? You know, praise Yah, hallelujah, you know, glory to the Most High. They begin to, to initiate their conversations with such, with such passages as that. You know, they begin, you know, the praises of Yah, they tend to talk about Yah. You know, their language yeah. seems to be centered about Him. You know, everything come out their mouth, you know, has Him at the forefront. You know, people kind of get tired of hearing the, uh, the language of the praiser of Yah. You know, those that's in the world, but those that are in Yah, they love it. Yeah. See, and you shouldn't be unequally yoked to begin with, and so you wouldn't have to worry about them not, um, not wanting to hear you. Amen? Yeah. You know, but if you're yoked with another believer, then, you know, y'all talking the language of other worshipers of Yah. Oh, Yah is so good. Yes, he is. All the time and all the time. Yah, you see how that goes? And it just goes on and on. And y'all sit up there and y'all have a wonderful time and go to bed and, and do it all over the next day. You see what I'm saying? See, isn't living in Yah great? You know, <laughs> you know, but, you know, that's what I see in that, you know. You know, but the kids, they don't, you know, they're afraid to even speak. You know, in, in Yah's language. They, they, they're afraid to speak in a language that worships Yah. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that gives Yah the glory. Oh, that praises Him. Yes. 
You know, they're afraid of what the, the children of sin is going to say. Of how the children of sin are going to look at them. You know, come on, it's time to turn this thing around. You know, so, you know, this is, this is what's going on. But, you know, we can change these things. Let me have my next reader read Nehemiah 13, 27 through 31, please. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all that, all this great evil, to transgress against our Elohim in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of... yo yo -da. Yeah. yo yo -da, the son of... el Shaib. el Shaib, the high priest, who was son-in-law to Sanballat the Hornite. <clears throat> Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my Elohim, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and, and of the Levites. Thus cleanse them from thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business. And the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my Elohim, for good. Hallelujah. Okay, so again, you know, we see Nehemiah emphasizing, you know, not to give kids, you know, over to marry strange wives. You know, taken from Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 6, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of Yahuwah be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now some people wonder why they get destroyed suddenly. But thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art an holy people unto Yahuwah thy Elohim. How many of you know that you were called to be a holy, a kadosh people, a people that is set apart from the world unto El Yahuwah thy Elohim? You're not called to be common. You're called to be set apart. You're called to be kadosh. You know, you can't be kadosh. You can't be set apart. You cannot be holy and be doing everything that everyone else is doing. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. I know that's what you've been told, but they lied to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody got to tell the truth. You cannot do that. You know, when you are supposed to be a holy people unto Yahuwah, Yahuwah thy Elohim have chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth, he has chosen thee. Even you and I. Even all that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Nehemiah, you know, he went about rebuilding the walls. Of Jerusalem, you know, but spiritually speaking, he was rebuilding the walls of life. It should, this should be rebuilding the walls of the faith because, you know, this is what's entailed within this story. You know, it's, it's teaching us to go back to the dictates of Elohim so that we can have some walls, so we can have some parameters, so that we won't be just all over the place doing whatever we want to do. This is why the walls are built so that they can. Keep us in Yah, as well as keep the things of the world outside of us. Amen. Amen. You know, and, and this is where we want to get to. We want to rebuild the walls of our life. We want to rebuild the walls of our faith. We want to put some parameters on things. You know, you cannot do any and everything that you want to do. You can't follow every whim of your flesh. You have to filter these things through the word of Elohim. Amen. Well, I hope you learned the lesson that Nehemiah was trying to teach you, because this is the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.